Welcome to a virtual uh, Temple Bar. I'm Peter Murray and I'm chairman of the Temple Bar Trust. And the Temple Bar Trust is bringing uh, Temple Bar in Paternoster Square next to St Paul's Cathedral, uh, built by Sir Christopher Wren in 1672, just seven years after the Great Plague, so very relevant today. We're bringing it back into civic use. We will organise through the Washwell Company of Chartered Architects a busy programme of events. We will create a place for meetings, for dining, uh, with the Sir Christopher, Christopher Wren Dining Club. And we will also have a charitable purpose to support diverse access to the architectural profession. And I would like uh, uh, right now to thank all those who have supported us in funding the improvements to the building. We were hoping to be well underway in the construction at the moment, but of course uh, we've been slightly delayed because of COVID-19, but hopefully things will get going in October or November and we'll be up and running early next year. So we keep our fingers crossed that that, that will happen. It is going to be a fantastic space for architecture, for architects and uh, for the City of London. So. We look forward to uh, welcoming you there in person rather than virtually. Now, before we get on to the main business of the evening, I would remind you that uh, we would like to turn this into a lively uh, discussion at the end with a, a, a question and answer session. And uh, there is the Q&A panel on your screen and you can use that to uh, write your questions and I will read them out to our speaker. And our speaker is Karen Cook. Karen is one of the uh, five founding partners of PLP Architecture. And uh, she has huge experience extending uh, from London across Europe, Paris, Berlin and Prague, where her work has focused on the uh, workplace sector and public realm. She's leading the design for the tallest tower in the city of London, 22 Bishopsgate. Uh, which is now nearing completion. She's been uh, designing that for uh, Lipton Rogers and AXA. And Karen is also uh, the design partner on for Cannon Street, which houses the financial services company Fidelity. And it's a elegant red sandstone structure, an extremely sensitive site opposite St Paul's and of course just across the road from Temple Bar. So I'm uh, looking forward to hearing Karen's, uh, Karen's description. So Karen, over to you. Uh, welcome everyone. So I'm going to speak as uh, Peter said about two projects in the city which are now uh, complete and occupied or nearly complete. Um, and the, this first building, this is the, the building that was on the site before we started. Uh, it was already at that time owned by Fidelity. Um, their headquarters at the time uh, were at this location opposite. Um, and they uh, wanted to redevelop the building with a view to potentially uh, moving into it, um, although that wasn't a given at the outset. And of course, um, it was one of the last extant buildings that was uh, built after the war. Um, and I think it was relatively handsomely proportioned building. Um, it was a sister building to what is now known as One Carter Lane. Um, and together they formed a large podium which uh, faced um, Distaff Lane to the south and, and that made it a, a sort of unfriendly car parking face to that side of the, of the street. And then Bracken House, of course, is on the east and another uh, Wren jewel, which is St. Nicholas Cole Abbey to the south. Um, and it, it was really the view to the Abbey that was opened by the bombing of the war that the city planners wanted to then preserve. Um, and that had a, a, a lot to do with how we then had to approach the overall massing of the building. Um, and I think it's also uh, worth noting while we have this aerial view on the screen that um, most of the office buildings in the immediate vicinity are brown or reddish brown, either brick or glass, but reddish brown. 
um, with the exception of these two buildings that were owned by Fidelity. So it, um, from the outset, it was one of the things that we felt was important to also uh, do was propose an, a material which would be more in keeping with the red brown context to allow the monument, which is white, uh, gray, sandst um, Portland stone, to be put in contrast and be more apparent. So the, the, this diagonal view from Cannon Street to the St. Nicholas Cole Abbey was uh, the main determinant factor of, of the angle of the building. Um, another key point was what to do about the podium piece because the city planners didn't really like it very much that uh, there was sort of antisocial behavior linked with the bar here. And at this, at this time, they were also reviewing the um, public realm for uh, tourists around the cathedral and they really wanted a public realm space which would be more uh, confidential and more um, protective for workers who were in the area and, and wanting to enjoy a, a more private uh, public but, but more sequestered space. So we dropped that space down to the level of Distaff Lane and made it more like a secret garden. Um, and this is that view looking toward uh, St. Nicholas Cole Abbey, and then the, I think the uh, other um, important uh, townscape feature here is the uh, almost palazzo-like uh, form of um, Bracken House, which has a very strong middle base, um, and then it sits on a base and then has a setback top, and, and we felt that was important to um, maintain also the, the building on the southwest steps back, but we decided that it, it should step back, which helps break it down in scale a little bit, and it gives it a device to drop down into that lower um, level behind. So the, the frame uh, structure, which you see on the front um, facing St. Paul's, turns the corner and goes around to the side. And facing St. Paul's, we more or less retain the same notion as the existing uh, former building of the very serene um, gridded module and then as as we go around the building um, that language changes very subtly from a single story reading to a double story reading um, and then again on the east side brings in um, again the single story reading with the, um, some parts filled in for the core so it's a it's a, a framework which is uh, expressed in the red sandstone in, in very deep piers and and is sometimes uh, recessed glazing and sometimes the glazing is pushed out and sometimes it's opaque with a textured stone. So here you see that that idea going all the way around. Um, and the idea here was obviously to make it coherent as a building form, um, but to give it that variety uh, and response to its immediate context. This is the west face where it steps down into the garden. Um, and this is a detail of the sandstone and I have to um, say here that Grants, uh, who, who did the stone uh, work with us and then Gartner um, uh, installed it all on the facade and um, or they installed the piers that Grants created without the idea of the um, precast backing um, inside the pier, it wouldn't have been feasible um, either from time or from construction purposes. So the, the piers are, are 500 millimeter deep Piers, um, they span from floor to floor, to floor on a precast concrete backing so that that stonework is applied um, as flat pieces on the side and then a solid piece on the front. At the crosses, uh, it's a solid large piece of stone and that, that, that was carved away by a CNC piece and then some of the pieces adjacent to that were hand set to be able to feather uh, the jointing in and, and make it a little bit more coherent. Um, of course, on the top floor, we're restricted by St. Paul's Heights, but that created a, a wonderful opportunity for a private terrace um, with a landscape by Tom Stuart Smith, um, which is like an, uh, his version of the English garden. Um, and that, that offers a private space. In, and then the public space at the bottom um, is a very lush garden as well. Here we're on the left image standing at St. Nicholas Cole Abbey looking uh, on, on its upper level, looking across the garden and then to St. Paul's. 
um, so we're, um, I think uh, the, the same team moved, I mean, we were, we were really developing the design for that at exactly the same moment that we were restarting um, the 22 Bishopsgate site for uh, Lipton Rogers and for Access. So that was a very interesting comparison in scale contrast, but I think um, with moving to a larger scale building, of course, there's another question, um, which the city-wide uh, planners and um, pol policy makers were grappling with at that time, which was not long after the financial crisis, why would people want to come back into the city to work? Um, and why would they want to work in a tall building? And really the development idea for this building then focuses all around the social um, amenities inside, which are partly for tenants and partly for the public. And then of course the, uh, the contribution at the base. And I, and I am going to talk a little bit more about the base today than maybe you might expect, because I think a lot of you will have um, either been in lockdown and not, not seeing what's being installed right now, or it, it certainly hasn't been very widely published either. So um, the vertical village uh, is approximately 10% of the floor area of the offices, and it's aimed at uh, attracting smaller tenants who can't afford all of this amenity space in their own space. Um, and, and yet their, their staff can enjoy and, and share these spaces with other um, small companies and, and it has a more genuine non-office feel because it's mixing with other companies. Um, and then the, the urban market, the food market at the base is open to the public on the evenings and weekends as well. Um, so the uh, urban market is at level uh, two, which is actually the, the top of a four level space at the ground floor, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, it's part of the civic expression at the bottom of the building. Um, the innovation hub will um, include maker space, and it will also include some uh, space for um, qualifying startups at discounted rents. Uh, it will include broadcasting studios and project co-working space, so it's really designed to um, attract people both from within the building as well as from outside in the community. Um, the gym, again, trying to offer something that a tall building can do uniquely that your gym at home cannot. So uh, climbing wall on the glass, um, a high altitude training room, and then the classes together with uh, your friends or colleagues, um, at a, uh, which can be more spontaneous. Um, mental health and physical health are something that is more important now and uh, again the building has enough of a critical mass that they can offer um, visiting surgeries that people can then um, take advantage of because a lot of times people will feel uncomfortable leaving work to stay at home and go to the doctor. Um, and then the club is again a space at the top of the building where um, tenants in the building can maybe a smaller tenant on the lower floor doesn't have such a, uh, an amazing view and he wants to um, uh, take part of the space either for a conference or for private dining for a special client. And then of course at the very top of the building are um, five floors of restaurants and terrace and public viewing gallery um, which uh, I think will be <clears throat> Um, the highest in Europe and, and uh, that is free to access. Those are views that were taken uh, a few months ago before the space was enclosed. And then if we move to the public realm, um, this is actually a, a slide from the dra draft city um, planning and street uh, strategy scheme that they, they will bring or they have been bringing a lot of this forward a lot faster due to COVID and trying to make people feel comfortable walking in the city, um, <clears throat> closing some roads to cars altogether during high peak uh, uh, rush hour and um, adding um, shared surfaces and uh, planting trees. And this is going to benefit, I think, everyone working in the city and on their commute to work. And these are two of the spaces uh, to, to the west and to the north of 22. Um, and then our 
contribution to the public um, realm path, path, passageways are that, that we added a, a passageway which wasn't there before um, underneath the building, which will help uh, take pedestrians from going from Bank Junction to points Easter, Easter further, further east in the cluster. Um, and because at the moment they have to go either uh, via the churchyard or all the way down um, via Leadenhall, and it, it's quite a long walk there. And, and um, Threadneedle is uh, very likely to be, um, well, they're looking at whether that can be reduced to traffic as, as well, because it's quite narrow, the pavements are quite narrow there. Um, and then, of course, uh, the number of cycles in the building is, is it's probably the largest cycle park in London, but the, I think the most important thing is that it, it has a wide, because of that, it can afford a wider facility beyond just the showers and changing rooms, but also cycle safety classes and uh, bicycle repair and, and cleaning of the cycles and clothes uh, drying and um, you can buy kit and so on. Um, but in order to make it better for the bi bicyclists and better for the pedestrians, um, the city asked us to come up with a way of reducing the number of vehicle trips to the building. And uh, this is where Stuart brought in uh, an army logistics uh, engineer or former um, in order to figure out how to um, increase the occupancy density from one person per 12 square meters, which was what the former consent was designed for, to one person per eight square meters. And then on top of that, we're making a bigger building. Um, so in order to reduce the number of trips, uh, the idea of consolidation was brought in. It's, it's no different than um, how Amazon now deliver to your packages at home. Um, and it actually means that the number of trips forecast is uh, approximately 70% lower than would otherwise be the case. And so uh, this red line here shows that the um, vehicle trips can be dropped to zero during um, morning, noon and evening uh, rush hour. And the city has now decided to roll this out in their new draft uh, plan. And that, that means that, for example, on the east side of the building, where we have now undershaft uh, and 122 Leadenhall is here on the left, and um, Eric's new one undershaft building is just behind us, that can be uh, a, a vehicle free space during uh, peak pedestrian times. And we are then also lens providing new landscape um, and turning part of what is public highway into, into um, pedestrian space, pedestrian accessible space um, on the east side of the building. So that side of the building is much more informal in its visual attitude than Bishopsgate side. Um, wind, of course, as you probably are all aware, uh, in the city is, is an issue. It's an issue even without the tall buildings. And uh, the fact is that the cluster is creating uh, quite a large body uh, against the prevailing southwesterly winds. And one of the objectives of the city in broadening the cluster at lower and lower uh, heights is to help break up naturally that wind so that the buildings themselves, uh, because once you're dealing with wind at this scale, it's really a wider scale issue than just uh, at the site of the building. But we did work with um, Formula One uh, wind advisors as well as uh, the wind tunnel um, facility to, to come up with some solutions. Um, and one of the um, basic uh, ideas was the very dramatic canopy, um, which we chose to do in a mineral, um, it's an ultra high strength fiber reinforced concrete, which helps visually tie the base of the building into the conservation area, which is predominantly Portland stone, of course. And it visually holds up this very powerful tower above. So the canopy really has to exist at the scale of the power of the building. Um, and in a way, it gives the base permission to be quite messy while the tower above is um, uh, quite taut. Um, and it, it, it at nighttime, you'll be able to see all of the activity inside in the different levels. So this is 
um, showing the escalators that take you up to the food hall, uh, urban market level. Um, the lifts are double decked, so that gives us automatically the bridges that um, fly through the space. And then there's an intermediate level which has um, additional shower facilities on, on the opposite side, which um, are for people working in the building before they might go out in the evening. And then the red you see on the right is the public entrance to the top of the building, which is also where the passageway is. And that's a, a recent photo I took uh, just to show the effect in real life, um, where they're still working on installing the trees, uh, which are meta sequoia, um, <laughs> 16 meter high trees. Um, and the artwork, we are working with a number of artists. Some of the artwork is incorporated permanently into the architecture um, to enrich the public realm and uh, bring some color and some of it will be curated and uh, changing um, at the main foyer levels. So this artwork is by Alexander Beloshenko, and this was an earlier version, and this is the installed version. Um, he's working directly in the computer, and then it's being printed on glass <clears throat> by SIDAC and installed by Gartner. Um, and uh, I think the printers weren't aware that their, their equipment could produce such colorful, because normally they're doing just the black edging on the gasket that you normally see on double glazing. So uh, we're quite happy that we could work with an artist um, in order to make it feasible for cost and time and commercial reasons. It worked very well that he could work directly with the glass producers. Um, and this is his artwork uh, drawing for the uh, public passageway that goes underneath the building. Um, and I should point out that his motifs uh, and colors uh, for both the exterior and this, uh, this open air passageway are drawn from the uh, city uh, livery um, guild mantle and crest, um, cloak and mantle and, cr and crest colors. So he was very intrigued by the idea that the artwork would um, go back to the historic uh, tradition of, of bringing craft into buildings. Um, and we are bringing craft into the main entrance hall as well. The um, ceiling is designed uh, and, well, we, we worked on the design, but the, the maker is Bill Amberg, who has a studio in West London, and he's very active in um, the leather uh, industry, generally supporting younger leather makers. And the furniture is a French uh, artist, um, Pierre Renard, who it has designed and sculpted and handmade these very large um, furniture pieces, which uh, it really re replace the traditional reception desk because the, the concept is that um, everyone can enter the building without going to the reception desk. Um, visitors will receive a QR code with their Outlook invitation and they can use that the way you board a train uh, gate um, or an airport gate, it's exactly the same idea. Uh, and staff can use the same or they can use fa facial recognition if they would like. Um, and so really the reception desk is for people who are either uncomfortable with the technology or they lost their phone or um, just want the human interaction. Um, and th this is a rendering of the upper level. So we've we've, used the bridges and escalators as a way of creating some drama for the interior, which is visible from the outside and also people, uh, the public going up to level, the food, food market level would use the same route. Um, and this, these are again, sorry, it's not clean. Um, these are just uh, construction site photos that we took <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, just to show you the, the theatrical drama that you get and the um, different kinds of spaces that will be available to people when they're making their way um, to work because I think that you know instead of just rushing in and rushing to your lift hopefully you'll you'll think about going to the to the market level and and maybe meeting your friends either working in the building or or elsewhere in the community at the urban market level rather than going up to your office floor. Um, we're bringing the language of art into the lifts as well. This is Bruce McLean. Um, he has 
produced eight different artworks, which are paper uh, and, and paint collages. And then those are high resolution photographs that are screened onto the um, glass so that in any bank of eight lifts, uh, we have an individually unique artwork. Um, so the, the staircases are designed um, with bright finishes. Uh, it's the uh, rubber flo textured flooring and the walnut uh, handrail. And then in the end, actually, we, ha we have not put the plasterboard on. We've left the raw concrete. And Cartilage Levine are providing these super scale graphics. This is just a paper mock-up, but those will all be in bright colors as well. Um, so the, the glazing, um, I think, is, is very important to touch on and a little bit more because um, we, we opted for um, a cavity facade. As a tall building, it was um, felt that the fresh air should come through the mechanical ventilation. Um, we, we, Stuart did uh, agree or even uh, it was his idea, I would say, initially to go for the three meter clear height ceiling, which I, I thought was a terrific uh, step forward. I've, I've worked on a number of buildings in Germany and the Czech Republic and three meters is a standard there. Um, and it makes a huge difference on the comfort that you feel in, especially in the open areas and also on the daylight penetration, which is then much deeper into the floor. And we stepped the uh, facade uh, the ceiling at the facade in order to to create an even deeper daylight penetration. But the the facade is a, ca a cavity with an operated bl motorized blind, which um, occupants can uh, 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 operate with their mobile phone. Um, each individual unit can be operated separately. Um, it is overridden periodically by the building um, uh, smart system so that um, the, the building heat gain will be uh, optimized. Um, and the <clears throat> um, percentage of daylight penetration with this facade buildup, uh, even before we increase the ceiling height, is roughly 55% light transmission and a, a standard double glaze facade uh, without the cavity in the blind would have to have a solar protection, making it more or less 34%. So it's altogether a 60% increase in the daylight. And, and that's really the, um, it, it has a light silver coating, um, wh which is what gives it that appearance that it's transparent, but sometimes it's a little bit shimmery. Um, and these factors were all very important in achieving the well enabling standard that uh, we also introduced um, with this project. So uh, that's uh, where we are now. I mean, this building, this photograph is from last October, so um, I kept it because of the juxtaposition with the Leadenhall Market. Um, and also, I, I would like to credit the very big team um, that obviously is involved in working on a project like this. And there are a lot of number of uh, facets to address, both on a technical pragmatic level and on a conceptual brief uh, forming level. Um, and I think that there are some ideas there that um, hopefully will persist and um, take us to the next projects. So um, I guess if, if there's anything else I would like to add, if I have one 30 second slot more, um, the owner is working with um, uh, Microsoft to develop um, an energy saving system, which Microsoft have used on their own campus in the United States, which is uh, allowing a 20% year on year saving um, by recording basically everything um, that goes on in the building every year. Uh, they're able to, to, to monitor um, things that by hand would simply take too long to resolve uh, and figure out. So I think that's quite important as well. Thank you. I can, should I stop sharing, Peter? Uh, yes, we, I, I think if you stop sharing, then we, we both appear on the screen. Yeah. I think, uh, we'll, we'll, well, Paul's in charge, so we'll wait for him to do, uh, sort that out. But uh, uh, thank you very much, Karen. That was, that was great, really interesting to hear. And before I ask a couple of questions, I would remind everyone to uh, ask uh, their own questions on the 
Q&A panel on the screen. Uh, uh, Richard Saxon is the only person so far who's actually volunteered to do that, so please do add, add, add your questions to such an interesting presentation. There must be lots and lots of things you want to ask Karen about, but uh, I'll start off. Anyway, I, I, it's really interesting to see the sort of building that Fidelity have gone for, because I can remember when they commissioned their last building, they used uh, uh, Jean-Paul Carlier, the Boston neoclassical architect, and uh, the management then were absolutely convinced that people who were uh, investing money with Fidelity really liked the idea of the, uh, might say, the security that neoclassical architecture gave uh, uh, the impression of for investors. Uh, clearly, they've moved on since then as a client. Uh, yes, I, I, it, it was their intention that um, the, the Cannon Street proposal should be in the um, Portland Stone because they felt it was, uh, you know, a noble material and St. Paul's is, since is Portland Stone, so they felt that was appropriate and it, it took quite a bit of persuading that um, that it could be because I, I think they felt that red brick was was not noble enough, although Bracken House is such an amazing example um, just next door. Um, but but thankfully they were um, appreciative of the of the sandstone. It's a it's a uh, Lazenby sandstone, which is a a, a, um, a little bit lighter color than some um, and it has a lot of richness in it. Um, and so when, when we showed them actual physical samples of the stone, they were willing to, to go down that route. Um, yeah. Very good. And then to move on to uh, 22 Bishopsgate, and I guess this is something you get asked all the time, but it's always mm -hmm. in that, uh, you know, there is a lot of debate about glass buildings and uh, sustainability and Ryan Moore actually wrote uh, piece in the Observer only last Sunday, uh, he was reporting on a report that Arab had produced saying that uh, tall buildings were uh, really uh, not, not sustainable. How, how do you respond to uh, those criticisms? Um, well, I am particularly, um, I've written about that topic before, and I, I think it's uh, London is a particular case because there is a lot of London which exists already that we want, that we cherish, and that we want to keep, which is low-level buildings, and and yet uh, we can't afford as a society, um, or I would say the positive way, if we want to afford the schools and the hospitals and housing that everyone can. Um, not only afford, but also larger housing that, that actually fits the modern lifestyle, which includes working at home sometimes. Um, we need uh, to tackle our land value problem in London, which is very high. And the only way to do that, I think, is to start building more tall buildings. They don't all have to be 60 stories tall. I think that's also a, a misunderstanding there. You know. Um, you, you, we could have more 20 story buildings or more 30 story buildings and uh, find selectively locations where uh, they're acceptable um, to the neighborhood where, because the shops, you know, rely on a certain catchment. And I think you can see that now if, if, if there are shops in your high street where, um, you know, they've been deserted, unfortunately, over the last few months and, and they're going to struggle and, and they will only survive if there's a higher density uh, footfall and, and if other uses are brought into those. Um, with regard to glass, uh, again, I think, um, you, you know, we can manipulate the data as we, as we want. I think the important thing is that glass itself is actually a very sustainable material and it's all of the um, gook that holds it all together, which is terribly unsustainable and not long lasting. And the, there are cladding companies doing research on how to design and build facades without all of that material. Um, and unfortunately, it's our insurance system which has to change in order to, um, or, or because developers or building owners won't buy a material if the insurance industry doesn't insure it and the insurers won't insure it if it hasn't been tested for 20 years 
So there's a bit of a chicken and egg there, but the cladding companies are working on glass facades which are multi-layered with more layers of blinds in between without the thermal seal. Um, and it's a very, you know, it's, it's truly an active facade. It requires the human participation uh, to make that work. And I, I, I don't think we should rule out or, or, or lock ourselves in yet to any one material, because I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, th th there's a lot of innovation going on in glass and other types of facade engineering as well at the moment and other materials. So we do, we do have one question which uh, just relates to that. Fred Rogers says, presumably 22 predated UGF calculations, but have any calculations been done uh, on urban greening factors? Yeah, it did predate, yes. We submitted our application in 2015. Um, and, and, and no, we haven't done any urban greening factor. Uh, we, we have planted, uh, a, a long row of trees, uh, metasequoia trees. There are eight new trees on Bishop's Gate and three on the east side. Um, and there, there is a green wall on the terrace at level two, which you can't see from the street. You can uh, see it from the other buildings around. Um, so um, you, 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 you talked about uh, Stuart wanting uh, one person per eight square meters. Is there any, uh, I'd say, rethinking going into how offices in the city or in central city areas, because obviously you have experience of working on office space in, uh, very, uh, in other cities as well, but uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19, there is, I would thought, essentially going to be a rebalancing. I mean, more people, we don't know what percentage, but more people are going to be working from home uh, than were working before because uh, COVID-19 has accelerated the take up of, uh, of home working and one would imagine that that is going to be pretty permanent. And one, landlords will start to need to think a lot about, you know, what, what are offices for? Just as uh, we have been reevaluating them really over the last uh, uh, 20, 25 years, but this has obviously made us, we've got to think a bit quicker now. Are, are you thinking about that you know, as a practice and maybe for this building in particular? Uh, well, everyone is talking about it and uh, everyone is, um, I think it's too early to reach any conclusions, but we're, we're certainly talking about it. Um, at 22 Bishopsgate, um, all of the tenants said, well, we expect one per eight, uh, one person per eight square meters. So that's how it's been designed. <clears throat> and the building was 70% let at lockdown uh, or just after the American law firm um, took four floors at, at the top uh, in April. Um, the ones who had already done their fit out plans before lockdown started had done fit out plans for one person per 12 square meters. Um, and it's very interesting to uh, consider that, you know, they have maybe areas of their floor which are one person per six square meters, but then they have other areas which are more, um, more generous active collaboration areas. Um, and what that means is that if they are designing at one per 12, what it actually means is that the lifts are, um, if the lifts are designed for one, in, one per eight, there's 50% more lift capacity than the tenants are actually expecting to use. Um, and the, the, the engineers have already started working on um, touchless lift operation. Um, so that you can operate the lift again through your mobile phone. And, <clears throat> and they're um, also looking at, of course, arrival times at work, which are flexible. I think when, when the building starts being occupied, which is we're expecting January now, um, because the, the, there was a, 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 um, a cesture with everyone locking down, the, the construction site stopped. Um, and the fit out therefore stopped and that's resumed now, um, albeit that with social distancing on the way in and on the way out um, for the workmen. Um, but you know, because the building is only 70% let, uh, that, that, and then if people are flex working and also working at one per 12, they're calculating that actually it will be fine with two people per lift getting into the building. Um, and 
I think that will persist for some time until there's a vaccine and people feel safe traveling on the tube. I think with regard to the longevity of home working, um, I'm sure it, that some aspect of that will stay, but I think it will depend on the company because I, I, I think it's very good for us that we have the technology and we can do events like this and um, we can keep in touch with our project teams and have meetings with them you know, throughout the day. It's not so easy to meet new clients. Um, you know, you can't just walk up to somebody and say, "Can I zoom you, please?" <laughs> it's it's not the same as having an event like this where there might be a client there that I've been dying to meet, and it's the first opportunity in nine months that I could physically cross their path and maybe have a chance to dash up to them and 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 introduce myself. And um, you know, so I think uh, that people will actually be demanding to come back to work um, actually maybe not five days a week uh, maybe not all day long every day I think that the idea of trusting people to um, organize their time or organize their time with their teams um, has to be increasingly important and all of those trends were already happening it's just that COVID is accelerating them so do you, do you see an, an office building like 22 uh, much more meeting and might say social spaces rather than actually sit down spaces i mean as, as, as bloomberg uh, is an example of a building that has huge uh, uh, amount of uh, capacity for uh, meeting and greeting and all that sort of and less space for working do you do you see that balance uh, now shifting as we sort of get back to work after covid do you think well i certainly hope that the factory farming open desk landscape is dead um i think um you know, the work that that we do and the, i think any creative people and i think the creative uh people include now bankers and insurance people and and uh eventually even lawyers because the non-creative work is going to be replaced by um smart technologies um that actually the open plan desk uh, rows and rows of desks is probably the least uh supportive of the type of work that we do you know, you, you need either a collaboration area, which means sitting around a table together or sitting outside on a terrace together, um, or you need soundproof <laughs> uh, small rooms where you can either have a conference call or read a, a, a contract or write a report and really focus. Um, and uh, that work could either be done in the office in a specially designed spot i'm thinking of you know the library carols where we all wrote our seminar papers or uh you know it, it, because you could have quiet rooms where you're allowed to be in a big room with people but you're not allowed to talk um or you could ha do that work at home uh, so i i think the office is is going to change for that uh and and it will mean um more variety in the space and more outdoor spaces too probably but it will continue. I think it will continue. It's continued for uh, two millennia. I mean, I think the Royal Exchange for me is uh, actually the best example of the first uh, co-working space. <laughs> um, you know, the people of, of different uh, businesses met there at agreed pre-agreed times to trade information and try to sell something or try to get the edge on their competitor. Um, it was a gathering space. It did have stalls around the edges on multiple decks. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think those uh, congregation need, and I, I haven't touched either on, you know, new employees and company culture and training and uh, mentoring um, new and younger staff. And, and that actually is just extremely difficult to do if everybody's at home. Um, and, you know, it's a long way off before our housing is designed to um, allow everyone an appropriate space to work at home as well. If people have children or, you know, we have st young staff working on their ironing board because they don't have a proper desk. So it, we need to be able to bring them back into the office, I think. Um, Good. Now, I, 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 I think you actually answered uh, Richard Saxon's question, which was about uh, lifts and coping with restricted capacity. Um, but uh, uh, Fred Rogers has come back again and said, thanks for the answer, but sorry, what is the tree species on 22? It's Metis on Metisequoia. 
Four Cannon Street seems to be more positive. And he's also asking whether you calculated UGF on... I think they're, they're very different. I mean, Can Cannon Street is a small pocket park, which is extremely densely planted. Um, and 22 is, an, is on an urban street with a, a row of uh, trees on Bishop's Gate, which are metasequoia. Uh, it's the same species that you'll see at, at the bottom of the 20 uh, of St. Mary Axe. <clears throat> um, and then uh, there are more metasequoias on the east side as well. And then there's some, I would say, more um, traditional municipal type planting at the base of those trees. Great, thanks. Now, uh, you, you talked about the uh, city's transport strategy, which I think is definitely uh, one of the most advanced transport strategies of, uh, I think, any sort of central city area in a, a major uh, capital that, that I know of. Uh, but, uh, you know, is enough being done at uh, street level? Because uh, uh, people are, maybe uh, work times will be a little bit more flexible in the future, also as a result, result of COVID-19. But you are going to have a lot of people coming out onto Bishopsgate all at one go. And even at the moment, it's pretty crowded at rush hour. So how, how is that going to work? Well, have you seen the um, document they published in the FT? Um, I guess it was a month ago, maybe, um, <clears throat> where they're proposing uh, as a temporary measure immediately to close most of the major city streets. Um, it's quite astonishing and, and very annoying to all the taxi drivers, uh, but it's very welcomed by the bicycle uh, riders. Um, I guess, the, you know, the, the city had wanted to roll out some of that anyway, and, and this is a way for them to test uh, if that works and, and start to get TFL comfortable with some of how that might work. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the glitch at the moment is still the trains um, and, and people don't feel comfortable yet coming in on the train. <clears throat> and I think that the next question really, Peter, will be if some of that can be permanent, how do we design those streets to make them uh, you know, give the visual cues that they are for pedestrians and design some of the temporary cones and bollards that you see everywhere, um, you know, that, that can become quite cluttered. Yes, but, but presumably there were uh, uh, some calculations about how many people would come out of the street even before we got into uh, the state we're in at the moment. Uh, the, uh, because the numbers of people on city streets are, are becoming uh, pretty un, 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 untenable, really, and in, in quite a lot of streets, you in Russia, the, the traffic almost has to slow down because people are actually walking in the streets because it's the only place they've yeah. got to go. And I'm just wondering uh, what the, the, the total impact is. We, you know, you've got the scalpel is filling up, uh, uh, you, 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 you've got the Lenten Hall building, which is, is, is full. And so if everyone keeps work, uh, stopping work at about the same time of day, uh, your, the streets are just going to be absolutely crammed with people. So we, we've now reached the number of people working in the city who were working there before World War II, um, because there was a, a, a long absence of people in the city. And I, I, if you look at photographs taken at that time, um, people were pretty much dominating the street. That was not very safe for them, but they, they did pretty much have to fill the streets. And I guess uh, the question now is really, um, would it be so horrible if there were no vehicles in the city? Because it's, you know, if you, if you uh, walk across the city, it can be done actually fairly quickly. It's, it's not physically, it's not very large. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's just a few minutes from the center of the cluster to the public transport at the edges. Um, so I, I think that, uh, we're slowly moving toward that objective. Um, and COVID may have helped accelerate that aspiration. Um, because well, the, the city worked, worked perfectly well in the medieval period when it was a, a walking city. So uh, why, why not now? Yes, why not now? I think people, um, and I'm glad you brought up the word medieval because, um, and, and for me, the Royal Exchange, I mean, before the building that was built there now there was one before that and before that there was a need for it i, I think the first one 
um, built in the, in the 15th century. So I, I think that um, despite this technology allowing us to meet as we're meeting now, um, and I think that is convenient and it's useful, but it's a tool and we shouldn't let it control us. And, um, you know, it, it, I think people are social and, and for, well, for our own sanity, we actually prefer to meet each other in person. Um, and I, I, I could actually start to imagine a city that had more character with more people walking around and, um, you know, maybe all of the ubiquitous chain sandwich shops will finally uh, die a permanent death with COVID and in their place will come, you know, after the global financial crisis, there were a number of pop-up markets with um, really amazing, um, unique food offering, which was being created and sold by private owners, private entrepreneurs. And, and that has really transformed the character of London and the character of the city. Um, and, you know, it, I think the, the city will be looking to encourage more of that. Um, you know, so it, I, I think if there were more, a variety of activities in some of the older buildings, um, which are, are smaller, um, and people were walking around the streets more often and, and meeting each other across town. You know, if it were more pleasant to walk, people would do that. Um, that's been proven now at other locations in London. Um, and, and it would really give a lot more character to the city. Yeah. Now, now, here's the thing, a bit late in the day for you to do anything about it, but I, I was at the discussion the other day about uh, cycling and uh, accommodating cyclists in buildings and uh, there's a lot of debate about cyclists being might say more considerate and not all uh, imagining they're in the Tour de France and uh, so uh, somebody suggested that actually why, why do we uh, deliver showers in, and, and uh, I believe uh, the, the building is even going to provide uh, dry cleaning of uh, people's uh, uh, clothing for, that they've used during the day so that they can get back onto their uh, very expensive bikes to cycle home in uh, mint and uh, clean uh, clothes. So actually, I know Stuart was very frustrated about the amount of space that he had to give over to cycle parking and all the amenities that go with it. So actually, if you didn't, if you told everyone to cycle more considerately, not work up a sweat, as, <laughs> as, as happens in Amsterdam or Rotterdam or even Copenhagen, then you would have saved an awful lot of space. Well, I think that's an extremely good point. Um, at the beginning, uh, the idea was how can we encourage people to cycle more frequently? How can we encourage more people to cycle? And that was one of the uh, attractions. I think now it, it's starting to reach a critical mass in the other direction where there are people who, you know, there's actually a worldwide bicycle shortage at the moment. You couldn't buy a bicycle now if you wanted to. And everybody is looking at repairing their old clunker from, from childhood. Um, and it definitely will mean more people cycling who don't need to shower. And so who knows, maybe uh, it means that all of these buildings that do have large shower facilities will end up converting more of that to more parking space, more cycle parking space. So um, uh, one final question, because our, our audience aren't putting any on the Q&A panel, but there, <laughs> maybe there might be a couple coming from them. Uh, but uh, so uh, tell us just about uh, PLP, what, what, what has the impact uh, of COVID-19 so far and how do you see things panning out over the next year or so in terms of uh, work and where that work might be? And mm -hmm. um, well, I guess, of course, we all panicked. Um, I, I think the first uh, panic, though, was really uh, the day after the Brexit referendum. Uh, and, and maybe even six months before that, because a lot of inward investment had stopped uh, or at least went on hold um, a good half year before the referendum. And so we, at that time, almost all of our work was in the UK, uh, and, or almost all of it in London. <clears throat> and we realized that maybe we shouldn't um, rely on, on that anymore. And we started looking abroad again. And in our past, we had worked in the Middle East and in Europe. Uh, and so we, we rekindled and made new contacts. Um, and we're working 
in Holland, of course, they were impacted by COVID as well. Um, we're working in Singapore and in Tokyo and uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and in Russia, we have a, a large headquarters uh, for Yandex, which is their equivalent of Google. And when we took on some of that work, I thought, gee, do we really, you know, is this really reliable work? Um, are, we, are we getting ourselves into a pickle here? And thank goodness we did have that work because it's paid right the way through. Um, uh, in Asia, they went through COVID just before we did and they got it under control quite quickly and they came back to work. So there was a period when, when they were stopping, but they, that was only a few weeks. Um, you know, we, we did, of course, start home working the way everyone did. Um, and that's worked. A lot of us have worked together for very many years. So that that does work. But as I said, it, it's not so uh, good for the youngest ones. Um, and we managed to win a new contract for a new job in the city, which is also, uh, you know, great. Um, uh, it's an office building. Um, and we're thankful that that client wants to continue. Um, all of our sites in London went on hold, uh, for example, the South Bank project, but that's now back uh, as well. So I think, uh, you know, our clients didn't want to stop either. So uh, everyone is doing their best to keep a, um, you know, positive outlook. Uh, I think time will tell as the year goes on. Um, we're trying to take a view on what it would mean to go back to the office in September. Uh, some people are in the office now, so people who can cycle or walk to work. Um, there's about a dozen people in the office out of 150 odd. Um, so, you know, we're just um, hoping that the, the, you know, the number of new cases in London at the moment is um, very, very low. I don't know if you look on the London data website, but, um, you know, everybody uh, did their part here to keep it under control. And I guess um, I sort of personally feel that it's important to try to go back to work, but then be extremely vigilant and, um, you know, be ready to go back home again quickly if need be. And, and maybe that means that, uh, you know, we need to go to work not every day, um, but organize very carefully with our colleagues why we're going to go in and, um, you know, have our project team meetings together face to face and then go home and do our focused work. Um, uh, uh, just before we finish, we have got one question here from Chris Dyson, who says, great presentation. Thank you, Karen. I'm interested in the canopies and how the glazing brief was developed with Alexander Belashenko and how well it seems to relate to the historic context in terms of scale. Um, well, that was a, a big adventure. It's a big canopy and there's a lot of, of um, you know, the upper level, which is about 17 meters above the street, uh, which is predominantly the ultra high strength uh, fiber reinforced concrete, but then with intermittent glazing elements uh, that interrupt at the column locations. And then the very large canopy as well at, at uh, roughly seven meters above street level at the northwest entrance to the building. And that pretty much covers the street that takes you into Great St. Helens Church, um, Parish Church. Um, and that was one reason why we made that glass, uh, because I think um, Stuart in particular felt that that needed to be daylit underneath um, and, and not in shadow. Um, and Alex uh, has experience with glass artwork before. He's actually a glass artist. So his, his whole career was about making glass and making colored glass. Uh, he did a beautiful church in Bavaria um, in um, glass and, and blue, blue glass with the motif of um, the Bible stories. And, and then he did uh, actually um, one of the Jubilee Line stations as well. So that, that's where he, you know, with those projects, he started to get experience with larger quantities of glass. Um, and we worked with um, Gartner and Interpane to source a company uh, in Germany who could have good enough technology to print at extremely high resolution. 
um, <clears throat> and, and they went through a number of uh, tests together to come up with the correct RGB um, values to get the right colors that Alex was really after. Um, and you know, some of the colors, because they're printed colors, some of the colors are translucent and, and let light through and project a uh, color onto the pavement. So the blue, for example, projects blue onto the ground. <clears throat> the reds uh, you do let some light through, so they're luminous from uh, below when the sun is shining on them, but they, they're, they're not luminous enough to project the red onto the ground. So, but it, it's, uh, they do project their shadow pattern. So Alex was really cognizant of all of those technical um, factors and, and thought about all of that while he was developing his, his artwork. Um, Good, was it? Thank you very much. It, it, it was uh, uh, Southwark uh, Underground Station for the, uh, the Jubilee Line, wasn't it, which he did with Richard McCormack. And I think Richard yes, McCormack is always yeah. one of his, very proud of uh, the way that the architecture and the art uh, work together there. Uh, so, uh, well, we, we are just about up to time. So I'd like to thank you very much, Karen, for a splendid presentation. I, I think it's always interesting, tall buildings, uh, that they, they go over various um, economic cycles, don't they? I think it was over 20 years ago that Helmut Jahn uh, had a project for that site and uh, yes. he, he, yeah. he, he went home because he couldn't stomach the interference from uh, Peter Rees and the city planning department. But yeah. uh, apart from that, uh, it was uh, it, it has been a, a, a long project and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing it uh, fully occupied and uh, see it in the flesh in some states. Yes, at the top. <laughs> yes, and I, and I hope as well, I mean, I think it's one benefit of meeting in person. It would be very nice to see you all in the Temple Bar in a Christopher Wren room and, and, and Chris Dyson's renovation too. So um, look forward to that also. And thank you very much for having me tonight. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.